All right, welcome everybody um, to our Acherednoya Zosudania of the uh, Russian History Seminar of Washington, D.C. Um, Chris, if you're not recording this, we can, oh, we are recording this, great. We're on the record, so keep that in mind, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Sarah Brinegar here. Uh, I, since you saw her materials, I don't need to introduce her at great length, but let me say just that she received her PhD from Wisconsin-Madison and is currently working at the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum and finishing the book, uh, the a book on uh, the uh, politics of oil and Baku, and you're reading chapter six. We're discussing chapter six of this. Um, since our usual kind of modus operandi is to go around a circle and introduce ourselves. It's not really that great an idea on Zoom. However, you might want to say a few words about yourself and who you are so that everyone, will, when you speak, everyone will know who you are. And that would sort of create, I think, a different atmosphere. Also, um, I will sort of chair the session. So our, our game plan is Sarah will say a few words first. I have a little commentary to get us started and then I will collect a list of people who want to speak. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I know that it is incredibly beautiful outside and you could be doing something else, at least those of you who are in the the DC area, so I appreciate it very much. Um, and thank you in advance for any comments. I appreciate you taking the time to read it. Um, as Michael said, I finished my PhD at Wisconsin several years ago. I've been in DC for a while working on other projects, um, but I'm revising um, and working through my chapters. This is my, my final, it's the final chapter. Um, in the manuscript, but I'll kind of give you a more of an overview of the big project um, before I give you some context for that chapter. Um, so the project itself actually came out of a different project. So when I went to Baku for the first time, um, way back in you know 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I kind of had a different project in mind. It was much more of an urban history. Oil was not really the focus. Um, and then when I got there, I just saw BP in Halliburton everywhere. Um, and I was <laughs> very curious, what, like, how is this so pervasive? How is this everywhere? Um, so I tried to read about it and I really just didn't find much um, at all. I, and, and what I found was not answering any of the questions I had and didn't find it interesting. And there also just seemed to be this huge gap. Like I had no idea what happened between the collapse of the Russian empire and like 1960, um, a little bit around World War II. So I, that's sort of when I started trying to ask more questions and thinking more about doing a project on this topic a little bit more seriously. Um, then I had the problem of the literature. So the literature that does exist is extremely contradictory. And the material coming out of the Soviet Union and the material, the little material that we have um, coming out of Western scholarship, they clash on pretty much everything. It was important, it was important, it existed, it didn't exist. So that was um, also very confusing. There were things like all of these statements, the industry had burned to the ground in 2005 and then it wasn't important anymore. That was somehow extremely important for the Russian war effort in World War I. What happened <laughs> um, in that time period was very um, unclear. The, all of the Russian and Soviet literature in particular told me and uh, the Western literature at the time, that the production levels were so low that the industry was completely irrelevant to begin with, and it wasn't really even a topic um, to be studied. And But then at the same time, I'm reading all this material that's telling me that the Bolsheviks were absolutely intent on taking Baku because they needed the resources to fuel the Red Army. So I'm thinking, what's happening here? Um, so that's sort of the the reason I started asking questions around this topic. I just wanted to find out what actually happened here. Um, how is the industry both completely, completely vital for the functioning of the state? What does that even mean? What does that look like? Um, what 
role did it actually play in the early Soviet Union, if any? Um, how was it related to the formation of the Soviet Union? How was this understood as a local resource? How was this understood regionally? How was it understood kind of on an all Soviet level? So that was, um, those were the types of questions that are, are informing the, the various chapters. Um, so really, it's also just like tied into my broader interests about wanting to understand the 1920s and wanting to understand sort of the reconstruction and the construction of uh, the Soviet Union, especially in that early period. So what the, the big kind of question that I had was initially just how, how to reconcile the fact that I'm all of secondary literature I mean, this is irrelevant and then getting in the archives and actually seeing that there is just a tremendous amount of material that was available and that there were lots of things that could be happening. So I wanted to explore that a little bit more. Um, the format that I eventually ended up with now during the revision process was looking more at the various ways that you go from a very chaotic civil war with the invasion of Azerbaijan and Baku in 1920 to the final kind of consolidation of a Soviet policy uh, around oil and uh, kind of a more, I don't think it's more traditional politics in some ways, but that is this last chapter. So the other, the other chapters are uh, a little bit more chaotic, I think. Uh, I think that they, um, they have a little bit more of like a momentum and a drive, which I don't think is like a great thing. It's one of the reasons I want to have you guys read my chapter. Um, so I think this, the, the chapters, I could go over the other ones, but just very briefly, it looks at the, I start with the invasion, look at restarting shipping. What are the actual conditions in the fields? How is this working? Um, trying to get the oil to market, setting up foreign trade, uh, all the contradictions inherent in creating a, foreign trade, but both within Transcaucasia, but then how Transcaucasia fits in the Soviet Union and how it fits internationally. Um, chapter two is the invasion and occupation of Gilan and sort of the after effects of that, specifically the after effects of that in the Azerbaijan Communist Party. Um, and then the third chapter looks at the Genoa Conference, so sort of the end of that, that pivot from revolution to trying to reach out and become part of the international financial system and economic system, which doesn't go well internationally, but domestically, they actually have a, a lot going around the oil industry where they basically thwart Lenin's concessions policy. So that's the third chapter. The fourth chapter kind of takes, takes the threads from the first three chapters and they all come to a head at a big central control commission investigation um, in in Azerbaijan where they remove the person who had been in charge, Nariman Narimanov. Um, and they basically ends with Kirov and Orjana Kidze in charge um, and Serebrovsky, the head of the, the oil industry. And then this final chapter is that, that final sort of transition. So it's both that consolidation to that type of politics, but it's also, um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. It's the consolidation to that more normal politics, kind of the end of the, 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 the binding. Um, but also they're still doing this in, a, in an era of extreme shortage. So the, the reason I was hoping to get feedback on this chapter is because no one outside of my dissertation committee has looked at it. <laughs> and that was a very long time ago. Um, hi, Fran. Um, so I felt like and, and it's changed. It changed in the writing and it actually changed from my original proposal, um, even for the revisions. I had been thinking about focusing on the role of intermediaries in Soviet foreign policy and looking at, um, I mean, obviously, you could, I think that there, I think that you could argue, and I have argued, and I had a different version of this chapter where I argued that this was a total failure. Um, and I think I changed my mind. Um, I became convinced sort of reading more through this and thinking about it differently that I was seeing that there were ways that this was actually extremely productive for them and succeeded kind of in spite of itself. Um, so that is, so yeah, that chapter has has had a, had a shift that might be um, obvious or not. Um, so I am interested in whether or not um, 
it does look like it was successful, what ways it was, what ways it wasn't, is this more of a compelling story of it working in spite of itself? Um, so these are some thoughts that I, I'm still grappling with in refining the argument. So I will leave it there and thank you very much. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, I, in keeping with our recent practice uh, in Zoom, I think it helps to jump or start our discussion with a, a commentary and we've been having these. So um, I prepared a short commentary uh, and it should take maybe less than, more than five minutes, but less than 10, something like that. So in this chapter, you have political intrigue, you have hard currency economics, you have foreign policy and the great game, you have petroleum politics and bureaucratic infighting, you have some outsized personalities. So if you only added um, a romance, you could sell the movie rights, I think. Um, but seriously, it's an, as it came out, I think in your comments on the historiography and the archives, it's an exceptionally complex story with many dimensions that you have kind of unraveled in very detailed narrative. And so uh, you definitely took a lot of intensive interpretation of all those files in Rgaspi and Garf and Arda. Um, but I mentioned movie rights only a little facetiously to underscore the potential drama of this topic. And I have to say that you don't make it that easy on your reader, especially in the second half when it comes down to a kind of blow by blow um, bureaucratic multi-agency uh, commentary and, and, and uh, um, you know, poli political infighting and so on. So my own suggestion would be to cut down on that detail in the second half about negotiations and maneuvering to highlight the takeaways and to inject both context and interpretation, uh, including I think maybe uh, clarification on how this material relates to the overarching arc of the book. Uh, and I would suggest sort of doing that in a way that would make it easier on the reader by injecting explicitly analytical sort of passages and pauses for synthetic interpretation along the way. Right now, a large amount of both synthesizing the material and making sense of its importance is sort of placed on the shoulders of the reader. So um, I'd like to ask a basic question. You partially addressed it in your remarks on the successes and failures, but beyond that, what exactly is your argument in this chapter? How would you formulate what you are arguing and accomplishing? And I think related to that question is what do you want as the potential audiences for this book? Whom do you want to speak to? What I personally see right now is that the first chapter, a uh, first section of the chapter engages especially new Soviet agendas and approaches that were caught up in the turn to NEP and the end of civil war, which you alluded to also at the beginning. And the second half is above all concerned with tracing the evolution of Soviet involvement with the Iranian oil concession, primarily through this institutional and bureaucratic political disputes and strategies surrounding it. So that's, I see the, the two kind of focuses. Uh, you've told us that the book explores the politics of oil and the formation of the Soviet Union and integrates the um, history of Soviet oil into the global history of oil in the 20s. And that this chapter, quote, looks at what this new non-revolutionary version of Soviet foreign policy looked like with a focus on an oil concession and company. And you also have addressed this question of, of success. And of course, in business terms, unsurprisingly, it's somewhat of a dismal failure, but I do think it comes across pretty clearly, although not perhaps as explicitly as you might make it, um, that politically and geopolitically, it's much more of a success. But I wanna um, take up this question of non-revolutionary because you qualify that later on 
somewhat on page four by saying, quote, the Soviet government may have turned away from exporting revolution, but it did not abandon its revolutionary principles in toto. So what I would like to suggest is that you are grappling in the first half of the paper with a new stage of the revolution, not some sort of non-revolutionary or post-revolutionary phenomenon. And this NEP was about a new stage, a new revolutionary timeline, and how to get to socialism differently than during war communism. And there is a long tradition, especially in this subfield of foreign policy studies, of kind of trying to separate revolutionary from statist or conventional foreign policy or non-revolutionary, which seems to be kind of what you're tending to. Um, but I don't believe that revolution and revolutionary can, in this period, can or should be disaggregated from other phenomenon. Because when the Red Army quite literally marched into Poland to export revolution, say in 1920, one could very plausibly say that certain non-revolutionary agendas, military or national or statist, were also in play. Gaining hard currency, pursuing a more conventional foreign policy, along with revolutionary party politics at the same time, because of course, the Baku Congress is virtually of 1920 in September is somewhat is contemporaneous here. But strengthening the Soviet state as the vehicle for building socialism was not purely or even primarily non revolutionary, but about different means of getting to the ends. And this, of course, did create lots of tensions and contradictions. Um, but promoting the so called national bourgeoisies in the East was not about abandoning revolution, but ultimately about a different strategy. And what you are treating so is sort of what I would suggest is a new. And it's exceptionally interesting how this goes from one stage to another in the long, you know, a revolutionary different stage of the revolutionary life cycle. Um, I think that, you know, Chicharin and Krasin were certainly non-conventional Bolsheviks or distinctive as Bolsheviks, but they would have been very surprised to be described as not as revolutionaries. Uh, Chicharin gave a lot of his fortune away to, um, you know, financing revolution. So gaining loans and hard currency for the Soviet state was about preserving the new homeland of revolution. So I still, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how, of your agenda for this chapter, even within the framework of success and failure. But what I'd say for now, from my point of view, from what I see here, is that you might think of injecting an interpretation of how politics, international agendas, economics, and oil uh, actually uh, interrelate and interact and evolve. Those are the balls you have juggling in, you know, up in the air. And secondly, related to that, how different actors, both individuals such as Krasin and Chicherin, but also institutions, Narkom and Yel, Narkom Nyeshtor, Ozneft, shaped that evolution and pursued differing if overlapping strategies so, so the new institutions of the party state are kind of ubiquitous here, but institutional history per se, perhaps not so much. As it stands, Krasin's agenda comes across most clearly, and those passages are extremely interesting. And the opening contextualization of Amtorg and Arcos, et cetera, was very effective. I think we need more of that kind of stuff. So one final point, I've gone on for too long, but it just on the Iranian, dimension, right? Northern Iran is clearly very important for your study, a uh, component of your work, and the Iranian material is sort of integrated in detail in your narrative here, that kind of coverage is integrated. But we get very little broader context on Iran, the kind that would really make it a kind of bilateral and transnational history. And I wonder, that's a question for you, if that can be injected. And I was thinking somewhat along the lines of the work of James Pickett for a somewhat later period. He had the article in Iranian Studies, the journal about the Soviet involvement and agendas in Iran in 45 to 51, but also with a great deal of, of contextualization of the Iranian side. So I will stop there and you can respond to anything I say or you can go straight to other people's comments. Thank you, that was very helpful. Yeah, I, I think, um... There's definitely, like I, I was rereading it and you know, I certainly agree that I have too much play-by-play, -play, um, kind of trying to 
to figure that out maybe is something I need for myself, but doesn't need to go all in the text. I, I think one of the um, one of the challenges I'm having here is, and I think it's evident, um, is how much context do I need about, I, I'm being pulled between context and Soviet context and context in Iran. Um, and sort of tying it to the other chapters, um, Iran has to be part of the conversation because it was the, sort of the vision for the Azerbaijan Communist Party, at least one wing of it included very much, um, us, or included Iran, especially Northern Iran. Um, so yes, I, I, I agree that that is something that I'm not, I'm not super clear which one needs more context or if I have room to do both. Um, so any other thoughts on that are, are very, very welcome. Um, also to the point of it still being revolutionary, um, yes, absolutely. And I think that that is lost because I'm trying to show how they're using these very traditional methods of, um, of foreign policy and power projection. Um, even though they are this revolutionary state, um, it, even if it, it, the means are not exactly the same, but they're very similar um, and they don't always work, right? Like the, I think that there is a lot to be said about what's happening in Iran, especially around the, the Mejlis and all of the Soviet involvement and that, that's a whole other story. Um, so that is, that is um, a point well taken. And in terms of the the argument, I think, I think I was making a historiographical argument in part that was not explicit, um, that probably doesn't work if it's not explicit, which is this idea that um, basically there was no active Soviet foreign policy after they gave up revolution, that there is this big retreat. Um, and clearly they, this is not a retreat at all. They're very active. They're active all over the place trying to um, become involved in both the political parties, but obviously for the um, purposes of this chapter in oil and the idea that Soviet oil itself is basically disappears from the international stage um, is not there. So I think it, in part the argument is a historiographical intervention and a historiographical argument. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and the other part of that is that trying to show how they are able to have this kind of impact even if they are um, even if they are constrained and sort of figuring out along the way I think a lot of this is trial and error um, you know they make a lot of mistakes with this company that they then understand you can't actually have a foreign person who does not like the Soviet Union be in charge of your company. <laughs> um, you need more leverage if you're going to do that, things like that. So um, kind of get, get a little lost in the weeds, though. So I will, I will stop there and answer more questions. Thank you. So I'm collecting a list. And I, in the order that I see them, I have Eric, Christine, Brad, and Sarah. But you can either raise your hand or say in the chat, as other people have been doing. So Eric, you're first. Well, this is quite a feat. I, I really enjoyed the empirical contribution. Um, 30 years ago, my first graduate school paper was on the foreign concessions policy in the 1920s. And uh, I found none of the kind of detail that you found about all the workings and negotiations and such. So it was totally fascinating for me. Um, I never published that paper, so I'll send it to you. It's, it's kind of like an ar archaic thing. And um, uh, you know, it's, it, the, you're right, there, there just isn't all that much um, written about all of this. I mean, the concessions policy, by the way, was all about oil. I mean, it was the great majority of all the concessions. Um, so um, <clears throat> I agree with uh, Michael's uh, th first thought that movie rights came to mind. And, and I had a couple of con contradictory thoughts about that. The first was that this is a very Soviet story. It's kind of uh, like 12 chairs, Ilfin Petrov and like, all these shysters out trying to trick each other and, and corruption in a way that if you think about, you know, Russia had relied very heavily on foreign direct investment for its industrialization. About 50% of all of its new capital formation came from abroad and uh, it was pretty efficient. And the Soviet Union, these guys, like a bunch of 
like crooks can actually weasel their way in and <laughs> make their way into getting money from the Soviet uh, budget. And in, in some sense, my first thought was, well, this is a real commentary on how inefficient uh, the Soviet experiment was in the early 20s and how they were left with like the dregs. They, they couldn't get serious investors. All they could get were uh, people like this, uh, uh, this Georgian guy. And then I don't know if you've heard the story of Washington Vanderlip uh, out in uh, Sakhalin where he, he came in and got a meeting with Lenin, several meetings with Lenin and uh, they were about to support him with lots and lots of funds. And then they found out he was a total fraud and um, you know, before they actually invested. But it, all the concessions policy was full of stories like uh, of this. And it just shows that you know, a socialist uh, economy doesn't work well when it tries to do capitalism <laughs> and, and it's very inefficient. That was my first thought. But then I thought, actually, uh, I don't know the stories of the early Texas and Pennsylvania um, oil business, but I'll bet there's some Texas sized tales there too. You know, I, I, I suspect that if you put this into comparative context, you'd both have a really Soviet story, but also kind of general oil story of craziness and corruption and wild gambles and, and uh, entrepreneurs who just, you know, take things to the limit. So those are some of my things, but my, my general advice or sort of thought in terms of this chapter and probably the rest of the book is to is as is typical when turning dissertation into book is to, uh, to weave the larger contexts into the story, um, not just at the beginning and the end, but through the chapters as well. And one way to do that would be to uh, talk about the general uh, dynamic and problems of foreign concession policies. And generally, foreign direct investment, as I said, it was a huge part of the 1890 to 1914 industrial development of the Russian Empire. And um, uh, every single major industrialization in the late 19th, early 20th century de depended hugely on foreign direct investment. So to do it without that was an enormous, enormous you know, departure from the, the, the strategy. And, and some sort of nod to that, some sort of discussion of that context, I think, would be uh, good to have in the beginning and the end, and but also strung through a little bit, uh, perhaps. Um, and uh, on that, you know, there, there's a, a, a pretty good source on that by Leon Day on the politics of economic isolation. And um, I found that to be the single best um, insight into all of that. Um, but any other way too, you can bring in broader context. I think you did a good job in this chapter of doing it with foreign policy. Um, but the economic side is so massively huge that I think, I think that side, and with your other chapters, I suppose that's probably a bigger theme and that's something I would, uh, I would, I would push for is a little bit more on this whole dilemma of how do you rapidly industrialize uh, without any foreign loans or direct investment, something that oddly enough, Leon Trotsky became the head of the Foreign Concessions Committee in the mid 20s. I mean, what the heck is that? <laughs> what is that? It's such a strange story. I mean, it's so strange and um, so interesting and and worthy of, uh, I think, pulling into your story a little bit. Thanks. Do you want to answer each question as they come, or we can also gather several uh, comments, Sarah? It's up to you. Um, it looks like we have a lot of questions, so I can gather them. I will just very quickly say, um, that no one agrees <laughs> on the uh, what role foreign investment played in the 20s in oil. Like the Soviet, or like the Russian, the contemporary Russian literature says one thing, the English language literature says something else. And um, yeah, they are not, they're not agreeing. But that makes it very interesting. I, it was definitely present how significant it was is the fight. When Eric was talking about shysters and imposters, I thought also of Igor Fidyukin's work on entre foreign entrepreneurs during Peter the Great. So whenever you have this huge state upheaval, not just in the frontiers, but there's all these people who want to take advantage of it. So, all right, Christine, you're next. Okay, thank you. So this is something that I don't know very much about, but having lived in Oklahoma for 25 years, 
I am never surprised at what oil men and oil companies will do to make a profit. So I was quite struck at the very opening of your chapter that you said that this company made no money. And so I was waiting in the chapter for more of that. Now, maybe that's earlier on, but I, I think you do need to bring the oil business back in and explain, I mean, I had no idea, did they produce any oil at all from this these fields that they were lusting after or not? And particularly because this is the last chapter, I think there has to be some nod to that. I don't think it has to be a lot of information, but just to kind of explain that first statement of yours that they made no money and it's just a shell company, but you know, there's shell companies and then there's shell companies, right? So, um, but the other thing I wanted to say was this, that um, during World War I, the Russian army took over the Singer Sewing Machine Company and they, they just ran it into the ground because nobody knew what they were doing. And so like Eric said, it's, there is this kind of prehistory to some of this um, that I don't know if it would be helpful to you to take a look at it or you know to think about how does this fit into this sort of larger Russian slash Soviet context. And, and then that might help you in terms of thinking about what are the things to sort of focus on in, in the chapter. So that's it, thank you. It was a great paper, happy to have read it. Sarah, shall I get one more and then you can respond? Okay, Brad Bradley. Well, this was not intentional that you have two questioners in a row who lived in Oklahoma in the oil country. But I would add that it certainly is a kind of a swashbuckling, I think, um, business practice and, and way of life um, in the oil industry. And that probably is not much different in the Caucasus from what it would be um, in Texas. But, um, and I also don't really know, I don't, I'm not, I don't have much background in this kind of material. So I really got a lot out of, uh, out of the detail in, in your paper. And I, I would really be hard put to suggest where to make cuts or where to um, um, make revisions other than some of the things that Michael and Eric have, or, have already suggested about working in a little bit more of analytical commentary or markers, let's say. Postmark, you know, uh, markers along the way to help kind of guide the re reader through all of the uh, the narrative detail. Um, but I do have two questions, and they're both of a sort of what does this paper tell us about kind of variety. Um, and the first one is what does your work tell us about Soviet decision making and the decision making process and where did the decisions take place and who makes them. Um, when I entered the field, and this will surely date me, but when I entered the field, it was all about uh, the party and the leader and Moscow and ideology. And then there were various waves of revisionism. So there was uh, interest group articulation and there was center periphery and there were personal, personal networks and, and probably many more. And so I'd be curious what your story, where does, what, what does it tell us about the decision-making process? I mean, Moscow is kind of off stage, at least in this chapter, uh, periodic references to making a report or uh, the, the heads of the commissariats uh, um, um, making pronouncements of one kind or another, but it's a lot about the periphery. It's a lot about the various commissariats um, and are they, you know, are they kind of competing among themselves? Um, and one thing that, that I did not see in the paper, and I think I'm pleasantly surprised, I'm not entirely sure of this, I saw no references to the secret police, to the GPU. So I'm wondering who is collecting the information, who's collecting the, let's say, the foreign intelligence. Is it each commissariat is doing it on their own? 
uh, and they have agents, let's say, operating, or is this the GEPAU and you just don't, you know, you, that's behind the scenes maybe, uh, literally, and it's also behind the scenes in your chapter and, 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 and we don't see it. Um, and lastly is maybe this all seems very chaotic. And two of the subsections in your paper are about bureaucratic chaos is one of them. And who's in really in charge here is another one. So maybe like the oil industry itself, there is really a lot of, a lot of chaos and a lot of maverick um, operations. And does this say something about the Soviet system that in sort of in the geopolitical sense, it's maybe well suited to a kind of chaotic um, um, geopolitical and economic um, environment. So that's one question, and that's that's sort of the main question about your paper. The second one is quite peripheral, and that is is Nord Stream the most recent version of the politics of oil? And in the, in the 1920s, it was about keeping the Brits out. In 2020, it's keeping the Ukrainians out. Um, do you see similarities or do you see important differences with something that's very, very uh, contemporary and topical? But I enjoyed the paper and I thank you a lot. And I hope we can see each other at um, maybe next year when we're in person, I can hear more about your work at the Holocaust Museum. But thank you. Sarah, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm going to catch all of these. Um, so one thing about the um, the comparisons with the other oil industries is absolutely, I mean, back, Baku was called the Wild West, and they called it the, like, they would use the American term Wild West, um, and they would talk about cowboys, and they, so they had, like, they very much are appropriating that image as well as um, in the, like, 19... 1903 up through the revolution and slightly less in the 20s, but through that. So I, that is something that um, that is definitely a threat that's there. I think um, the concessions question, I, I was I'm looking at a little bit differently because there is there is quite a lot of literature on the role of foreign investment, um, and I think there is no question that the reason, like the ultimate reason, that Soviet oil industry um, was able to save itself is because they brought in American deep like rotary drills. Um, so that's a huge part of it. I don't, I talk about it, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit in my introduction, but I'm actually not talking about it as much in the chapters because the the chapter, I have the Genoa chapter is actually on concessions policy more directly um, and concessions policy within the Soviet Union versus this one, which is, this is their only foreign oil concession like Sakhalin is they, they bring in foreign investment, but this is them trying to go abroad. And that is part of what creates this, um, part of what's creates this confusion. Like the concessions committee actually doesn't want anything to do with this project. They keep saying over and over again, I think I have it in a footnote and I very much need to put it in a text. This concession is not on Soviet territory. We don't have anything to do with this. Quit talking to us. Um, but they don't have another mechanism for dealing with Soviet concessions abroad because it's not something they're doing. So they keep going back to them anyway. Um, so that is part of that um, context. I think it's a little bit ironic that I think that this is my, my least chaotic chapter. <laughs> um, the other, like this is actually the chapter where I'm like, and now, they, now they're cooperating with each other and trying to get something done um, so that I think needs to be drawn out more because it is actually about where decision making is happening and decision making is not happening in Moscow. And Moscow makes that very, very clear um, and very explicit, especially with Transcaucasia and says, um, you guys are on your own more or less. So we cannot provide you with any financial assistance. Um, and so the other chapters are kind of um, Orjana Kidze, specifically a little bit Kirov, basically in taking over the party in Transcaucasia and um, sort of him 
he, but I wouldn't say that he's not, he's not like a creature of Stalin or something at this point. He's just, he's someone who is capable of it, the way we would talk about it now, like balancing all of these factions, right? Um, and can actually get something done. So I think that there's, there's a lot of political vying in the other chapters that kind of end with this idea that Transcaucasia in particular, uh, and this is probably true elsewhere, and Sarah could probably speak more to Central Asia, that there is a, there's a large degree of autonomy. Um, and the concern is in kind of the, the ideological presentation and getting behind the right faction, which is other chapters. And in these areas, like there is a part of the control commission investigation that I look at in the chapter before this is about not what are you like not literally what are you doing on the ground but like are you officially following the line of the central committee and if you're following the line of the central committee you can have a free hand kind of to do what you want um so i think that maybe maybe i need to make that maybe that is a way to tie it into those other chapters and make that a little bit clearer um, because they really can kind of are doing what they want um in terms of the the secret police there are spies everywhere. <laughs> um, they're not super explicit and they're not writing these reports. Um, the reports are coming from these, these oil company functionaries and, but they are sending out spies constantly. Like I have hand drawn maps of all of the like the Anglo-Persian fields and they keep finding people sneaking in pretending to be oil workers and they're really doing surveys, right? So there's a lot of that of espionage um, happening kind of throughout this. I don't know that any of it is terribly effective, um, but yeah, they're all watching each other and they're all reporting on each other, but they are st they still do a bad job. I think um, the question about whether or not they made like the money, that is, that's the problem. There's they, they didn't keep any accounts. <laughs> like, and that's kind of the end is that they are, they're not keeping accounts, they're bartering, they're trading, they're, they're not, running a business really in any way that, that we would recognize a business. Um, they are trying to be present and like be able to, you know, stake a claim to this territory that's much closer to the, the Darcy concessions than the other areas in Iran. Um, and I think that, that that shows in the fact that we really don't know. And we know that they were producing some oil, but they didn't have, they had no transportation network to get it anywhere. Um, the roads aren't developed. There's not a rail connection yet. Like this whole thing was dependent on the idea that they were going to build railroads and pipelines. Um, they don't exist yet. So it's it's in that sense, it's like they drilled some oil in the in the salt desert, and then they had nowhere to send it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I think I, I'm not making these things explicit. Um, so they did bring in a lot of equipment, though. Um, and we don't have the material on that, but they did haul a bunch of very expensive imported equipment down there, um, th that, which is why they went back in 46 and reoccupied that area because they wanted to, to guard the equipment. What happened with that? I don't really know. Um, but yeah. Sorry if I didn't get to all of those. Um, feel free to, to follow. Thank you, Sarah. That was very interesting. I um, I have Sarah Cameron, his name was already invoked. And then I have Craig and Muriel uh, on my list. If anyone else wants to get on the list, let me know. So Sarah. Um, thanks so much for your paper, Sarah. I really enjoyed it. And as others have stressed, I'm so impressed. I mean, you just did a tremendous amount of work to untangle this story. The amount of archival work and detail is really, really impressive. Uh, so I guess I maybe I had just like a couple of practical, very practical comments first. You asked about the length of the chapter. So my sense is if you're thinking about, you know, you have five chapters and you're thinking about putting this into a book, that the chapter is probably a bit too long because I, I actually looked up the word, this chapter is close to 20,000 words. So if you think you have five chapters, that's already 100,000 words. And then you've got to have the introduction and the conclusion that's getting to be a a bit longer than you'd probably want to be in terms of an ideal book. So I think, yes, cutting and condensing some uh, would be would be really helpful. Another um, 
kind of practical consideration I was thinking about is I, I felt in this chapter I really needed a map. I needed a map of where all the various oil sites were and uh, you know where where and then you kept because it seems that proximity and transit routes are really important to your story here and of why you know the the Soviets wanted to get involved in northern Iran but you know I admit for you know for me I, I, the geography of this uh, I'm a little fuzzy on my geography of the South Caucasus so I think that would really help your readers to have a map of the oil sites and so on um, another another thing would be just because he's such a colorful figure, a picture of this guy, um, Kashtaria, right? Uh, I think that would also really help uh, enliven uh, the chapter and, and bring out different facets of your story. So uh, a couple of other uh, comments, just sort of bringing up themes that it, some people have already touched upon. So um, I will admit I, and this is, I'll expose my own ignorance here, I became very confused by some of the terminology that you were using. Uh, so, I'll, for instance, you talk about commor commercial firms as proxy for diplomatic relations. Then you talk about concessions. Then you talk about front companies. And I, I myself am actually not entirely clear on the distinctions between some of these things. And I think it's uh, the terminology that you're using here is actually very important to your overall argument. Because as I understand it, one of your basic arguments in this chapter is you're trying to say, well, uh, you know, uh, to the, so the, you know, the Soviets wanted to have influence in Persia, but uh, it was, there were also economic motives here too as well, right? Uh, so then if you, I, I'm just wondering then about the choice of front company, because front company to me implies that, that it's really only about political clout power, that there's nothing economic involved. Now I could be totally wrong. I don't necessarily know what these terms mean or how they've been used, but I just think it would be helpful to the reader if you explain why you're using these financial terms that you're using, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, I think another point that maybe could be, I really liked in the beginning how you, uh, as others have mentioned, you brought out the contrast with foreign policy in the West. And I think that you could return to that theme in the conclusion again. Uh, to, to sort of highlight it. Um, another um, sort of point of interesting point of contrast comparison is um, one I'm more familiar with is uh, Soviet influence in Xinjiang in this period. It, you see actually some very similar, you know, things going on. Uh, you know, they're trying to get Xinjiang as their zone of influence. Xinjiang is, uh, you know, it's, it's a borders, uh, you know, several Soviet uh, republics, uh, kind of not clear who's in charge. There are also economic motives to them getting involved in Xinjiang. So that might be also a, a comparison, a parallel that you're thinking about uh, in the back of your mind. Um, final uh, point I wanted to raise is, um, you know, there are many different directions you can pull the chapter and many other, um, many different directions you could take it as people have mentioned. Uh, I wondered also, if doesn't, and this is maybe along um, the lines of, I believe it was Michael's comment about Iran, doesn't the chapter also change how we think about the history of, of Iran? Doesn't it tell us something about that actually? And that's really interesting because obviously it's, it's really difficult to work in Iranian archives, but you found information that then tells us something about, uh, about the history of Iran, I think. Thank you, Sarah. It's up to you. Take one more. You can respond. One more. Okay. Um, next is Craig Kennedy. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for letting me join in on the conversation today. I'm a bit of an interloper, uh, but I heard about this topic and it's such a fascinating one. Uh, I wanted to join in. Um, I'm a, a, a former student of uh, Edward Keenan. So I worked on the early modern period originally. Um, but more recently, I've been interested in the history of the Russian oil industry from its, its foundings up to the present day. Uh, in the 1920s, I tried to tangle with a bit and it is immensely complicated. Uh, and I can't wait to see um, uh, what you've done with it. Uh, I unfortunately didn't have access to the, uh, the, the paper being discussed today. Um, but um, just piecing together uh, 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 various comments that have, you've made and others as well. Uh, one of the questions that I had for you has to do with um, not so much specifically this chapter and 
um, what's going on in Iran, although I did want to comment on that briefly as well, since I've looked at it both in the pre-revolutionary period and then after the, um, uh, the Second World War from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the, the Russian oil industry. But um, more broadly, this question about concessions and technology and capital, I'm wondering to what extent um, you've, you've looked at the role of some of the technical experts uh, that the Soviets are able to um, get back into the whole debate that's going on around what we do with this industry. Because is, is, I'm sure you've seen before the revolution, uh, Baku really from around 1900, 1901 is going into a sharp decline. And it's a technical decline because of an exhaustion of some of the, the natural energy that's in the oil formations. And the big question is, how do we, how do we stop this? And they develop um, this remarkable expertise, which in many ways is different from almost any other industry in pre-revolutionary uh, Russia, where you had um, uh, an engineering cohort that was as sophisticated, if not even more so when it came to not only using foreign technology, but developing their own technology and exporting it. Uh, than uh, anyone else in the global oil industry, including the United States, which we often think of as the technical leader, but in fact, in many ways was lagging behind um, pre-revolutionary Russia from a technological point of view. Now, a lot of these guys who actually had developed the expertise leave in 1917 or soon thereafter, but a number of them stick around. And so you start seeing them getting brought in and having some influence on these debates that we're talking about in terms of, do we give out concessions? What kind of concessions? How do we get capital? And what technology such as the rotary drills that you talked about do we bring back in? So I'm wondering to, to what extent uh, have you come across um, this cadre because they keep a fairly low profile but they actually end up playing a pretty important role from what little I can see. But I, I, I'm guessing you are much closer to it because you've been focused on the 20, 20s and in the archives. So, uh, but from what I, little I've been able to piece together, there is this titanic debate going on in, in the 20s. Do we need to bring in the foreign expertise to revitalize these exhausted fields and to bring the capital with them? Uh, or are we actually, do we actually have the technological know-how ourselves? We simply need capital, as Eric mentioned, uh, and also access to um, uh, uh, manufacturing uh, plants because much of the manufacturing plant had been you know, either destroyed or just sort of run down during this, the First World War and the Civil War. Uh, so I, I'd be interested in hearing whether this is something which is figuring into the broader uh, debates or the uh, broader um, thematics of the book that you're working on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah and Craig. Those are both very um, helpful. I'll start off I'll start from the Craig's. Um, yes, they are, have very fierce opinions. The geologists are very involved um, and the geologists don't want capitalists anywhere near their fields. <laughs> um, they're okay. And I, this is actually a, a, the second part of the third chapter which is kind of the alliance between these technical specialists, um, Smilga, Gukin, um, Galabotnikov is one of them that's in there. They mm -hmm. align together with Sarah Brosky, the head of the Azerbaijan Oil Trust, and Kirov and her kids say, and they kind of on the ground very actively try to go around the, um, they go around the foreign, um, foreign trade monopoly uh, to start bringing in material themselves. And also mm -hmm. they get the right to conduct direct contracts with foreign firms. So like the Barnstall concessions, these are, which is also has Mason Day and Sinclair behind it, the same people. Um, and they, they do bring them in and they basically through that um, are able to demonstrate that they don't need foreign concessions in oil. And this is also, they're cooperating with, um, with Grozny. Um, as well, and they're coordinating um, bringing these in, but they they have a, a very fierce internal uh, conflict with Crossan about um, whether or not they need to bring these these people in, and they are yeah they're completely against it, um, and they're very vocal, and um, 
I argue ultimately successful. I mean, obviously one of the reasons that they're successful is also just because they were absolutely misjudging their position, I think, the, the Bolsheviks um, at Genoa, at Locarno, after um, a, a very caricature kind of idea of what capitalists were, I think, uh, and thought that they could, you know, lure them to these fields that are basically a disaster. Um, but that being said, they did have a very robust specialist who knew what they were doing and ultimately did turn the fields around. So um, mm -hmm. I think that the, yeah, I think it's a, a really compelling and interesting part. And I was actually originally had been hoping to gather a lot more of that material. I wanted a chapter on geologists, um, but I didn't, um, didn't find enough of the right kind of material to fit into the, into this, but they're, they're definitely present um, in the background in this chapter. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, that's a, it's a, it's a great topic. Um, and I, I hope that there will be more written on it because I think that they're more active in these conversations, especially in the regions than we give them credit for. Um, Sarah. Thank you for giving me practical tips. <laughs> like this is really what I need. I, I, I agree that it's too long, especially after I reread it. And um, you know, when I have given talks before, I always start with a map. Um, and I think that that's something I need to go back to doing both of this area, but also just like, all you have to do is show a, like a, a topographical relief map of the Caucasus and see this very narrow line that goes between the Caucasus mountain ranges and see that there is a, a pipeline and a railroad there and you kind of have like half of your story written for you. Um, I mean, it's just really overdetermined geographically between these, these two um, seas. Um, Xinjiang, it's funny that you mentioned that because Judd Kinsley was on my dissertation committee and he wrote a book on this. Um, so I am aware of it and it used to be in my footnotes and then I took it out, um, but I will I will put it back in. Um, and I was also, I, the question for me that, that keeps turning is cotton. And also obviously the Donbass, right? Like they, they're in a similar situation where they have these um, all union trusts, they're mono crops, um, or products. And I don't, I really have not been able to find out sort of how um, Don Ugal is integrated or not integrated into the Ukrainian Communist Party and what role it plays locally. And especially in the 20s and the same sort of goes for um, the cotton industry. I know there's a new book that Imperial Desert Dreams, which I haven't been able to get a copy of, but that is a, a question um, that is on that I have grappled with and don't haven't really found a, a good parallel at this point. Um, but I, I definitely think I could bring in that you know this is a phenomenon that's happening all over and is obviously one that you know they literally use the same people um, to try to get control of these territories and exploit them. It's the same. He had all these concessions he had in Hoshtaria, he had massive concessions in northern Iran and forestry. Um, they seek to get those back so that there's, you know, it's much larger than just oil. It is the whole concessions and how it fits into the um, early Soviet reconstruction. Um, you know, I don't feel like I can say what this changes about the history of Iran. Um, I think that there, there's so much scholarship on this um, or on the connections between Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, Armenians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis with Northern Iran and with the social and political movements and obviously with the constitutional revolution and everything else that's happening. The, the 20s, um, What's hard for me to tell as someone who is not a scholar of Iran, but tries to you know, do my due diligence and read these other sources is that, and at least in terms of the Bolsheviks, you know, Reza Khan, Reza Shah is, he's very effective. He's very, like, he also makes a big presence in chapter two because he basically pays the entire red army off to stop rioting in Gilan so that they can get them out and evacuate them because they were rampaging through the city. Um, so he's, he comes in and out. Um, he obviously blocks them constantly. I mean, they, you know, they're 
having to work around him and eventually they can't and they just come to accept that they have to work with him if they're going to get anything done um i but you know i yeah i need to share this with some iran specialists um and see what they say specifically about those interactions i mean i think they know some of the articles that i have are written by iranian scholars or in persian studies journals and they have a very similar kind of line especially about oil which is that they were trying but they weren't terribly successful um so that's a not very satisfying answer but that's kind of where i'm at with that okay muriel yoffe you've been waiting very patiently Okay, I have um, about three points, and I so enjoyed reading this to the point that I have to get a ladder and get out of my bibliography cards to figure out if some of the people you mentioned were the same people I worked at, and I didn't break my neck. But, um, you know, you spend a lot of time talking about, um, was this political, was this economic? And, you know, although this is not the focus of your chapter, and I'm not sure it's the focus in your book, nor should it be, but essentially what you're describing here, and Eric will correct me, um, is basically Tsarist policy. And what we're, what we're dealing with is a Russia or Soviet Union who economically is fairly weak, maybe just not as weak as Iran, is competing with other people and is finding itself in a situation of lack of economic concessions, joint stock companies, roads, and trade. And so essentially what you've described is pretty much the same steps that the, the Russians developed in respect to Persia, although the discount and loan bank was obviously much stronger than the bank you had. So I think you could take what you've said and thereby strengthen the Soviet strategy, you know, the whole discussion of, of revolution or non-revolution or promoting the bourgeoisie, because the economics are pretty much the same, in my opinion. Another thing from my research on Iran in the pre-revolutionary period and the competition with foreign concessions is you say that the Soviets were very successful in basically getting a foothold in Northern Iran. Um, and it would be unreasonable for you to have to describe everything the British or Americans did. But I know where in pre-revolutionary Russia, the Brits and the Anglos, the Americans competed with the Russians. Sometimes the success is Russian, but it's also a reflection of what are the Brits and the American companies trying to do. And I don't know if this was a factor worth mentioning. And my last question for you, and it related to Craig Kennedy's question is, can you sometimes give the name and patronymic of the people, not like Chichirin, but Lavrentov, because Lavrentov, for example, my Lavrentov is somebody who's very, very active in creating projects to develop Central Asia. And so I was just wondering is, you know, is this the same cadre is, you know, are we dealing with the same school? So that's all I have to say. I thought it was really good paper and I really liked reading it. Okay, so do you want me to move, take another, or do you want to respond to that? Uh, why don't we do one more? Well, actually, Fran, you're the last on my list. So if um, others want to get on the list, please let me know. And Fran, let's go, uh, please go ahead. Um, well, but th thanks, Chris, Sarah. It was really great to read this. Um, I, I really in enjoyed this reverse, re so much revised version of it, and just seeing again how you've integrated all of this other additional research into it and expanded it. And um, 
and just the stories are the stories are amazing. It's it's such a rich chapter. There's so much incredible research in it. So I mean, having seen the the original project right at the beginning and see where it is now and see how it's it's evolving, um, and it's it's very exciting to see it on its way to being a book. I guess I wanted just to ask a little bit about because um, people are asking questions that now could pull you in in different directions with this. And so, what's your sense at at this point of like what are the big stories? That you want to tell, like what, what, where, where are the places that you really see the book intervening? What are the, who are the other scholars that you want to be in conversation with with the book, right? Because I think like years ago it started off in part about nationality policy and and the caucuses, right? Um, and and it's it's really taken off and gone in all of these really interesting directions. And I think that's going to be as you think about um, trimming and and highlighting key points, right? Um, I, so I was just just curious about like you know again like what what for you because there are so many areas that I could see you really making really important interventions right in terms of again thinking about economics and foreign policy that's that's one thing that comes through really clearly in this particular chapter in terms of again thinking about the evolution of the revolution and and what does it look like and what is the NEP really about um, in terms of how does the caucuses fit into the Soviet Union as a whole and how similar or how different um, is the story that you're telling from, from other stories? Um, so, I mean, I'll just stop, I mean, there, and there are others too, but so just to kind of put it back to you in terms of, um, yeah, what do you see as the, the main thing you wanna get across now? Thank you. As always, the big questions. Um, <laughs> 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 um, I'll, I'll start with Muriel's questions. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, so in, on the question of what are the Brits and the Anglos doing? I think that this is really important and this is something that I have struggled to decide how much to put in um, because I think you know, Britain makes a strategic decision that they are not going to focus on Iran, and they're certainly not going to focus on northern Iran, right? Like they, they have, um, they try to block them in this in this concession, um, which becomes a company, right? I mean, the whole reason that they want to get the rights to the concession is to create a company. Like they're not, they're not. It's not a concession in any kind of traditional sense. It's a concession to have the right to set up a company that can. Um, prospect for oil. So in that sense, it doesn't come with any of the other things that a Tsarist era concession would come with. Um, and this is another thing that happens. And, and this is this is something that I, I have basically am recreating the conversation that's happening in the archives. And I think maybe I need to intervene because um, even they keep saying, stop calling it a concession. It's a company. Like, this isn't like, it is a concession because you have to have concessionary rights to, to found a company because they're not supposed to be finding, they're not supposed to be able to have a company because foreigners are not supposed to be able to have the rights to, to drilling. Um, so this is why it's a shell company and why it's a proxy company because they have to have um, a local person who incorporates it so that it's technically Persian, and then they can drill. So um, the terminology is, 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 as Sarah said, not clear. Um, and also the way that they're using it isn't the way that it would even be accepted usage at the time, right? It's kind of the way that it evolves as they are um, trying to set this up and get the rights to the company. Um, but yeah, there is the, there is the, I think what's happening with the, the fight over the rights to the company and to that that concession in Kevir Horian is very different than what's happening with the northern five provinces. Um, and so those are kind of the two lines. The five northern provinces, um, they're trying to work with with Persian landowners and, and wealthy merchants to try to work with them on whatever company they set up because that goes to a Persian. But the um, the other company I think is different and, and the, the, the Brits are still trying to keep them out, but it's not their focus. They're focused on, I mean, they've just, you know, they're very busy elsewhere and they're specifically also very busy um, in the, the former Ottoman territories around Iraq um, at this time period. So 
yeah, it, it certainly matters. And that's kind of my, that's why I think that this is open to interpretation at the end where it's, the Soviets are successful. Um, how successful, are they successful because it, like actually Britain doesn't care? <laughs> um, I don't think it's as easy as that because they also could have, um, like they don't have to try to seek cooperation with Iran and work through their, their laws um, because they are also in the middle of consolidating power locally. So I think it's a little bit, um, a little bit more complicated. Um, I, I will take note on the name and patronymics. Sometimes I don't include them because I can't find them. Um, and I don't always know who they're talking about. Um, some of these are just signed letters um, and sometimes I can read them and sometimes I can't. And that, um, and so I end up having a lot of the same questions. Um, and sometimes I find these people somewhere else and I realize that it's the same person <laughs> and that they have been transferred. So, um, but that is something I will to try to um, make more explicit. And if I don't know to maybe include in a footnote that it's unclear um, who that is. Um, in terms of the France questions about sort of what are the big stories, I think part of this is just, part of this is methodological in that I think as Fran said, when I started this project, I was much more interested in kind of nationalities, policy and national questions. And that was why I was thinking in terms of the formation of the Soviet Union. And the more I, the reason that I chose oil, I kind of think of like um, Alison Frank's book on Galicia. And I think of um, even Tim Mitchell's book, books that are taking not kind of the, not, not the traditional revolution or foreign policy or nationalities politics. I, I'm trying to take a lens that lets me kind of flow through them. Sorry, I just said that. <laughs> um, but to bounce between them um, and see that, that, that this touches all of these different areas and gives you a different perspective on what's happening. Um, if we just look at Soviet foreign policy in Iran, um, it's, it's you get kind of stuck in the, is it revolutionary? Is it not revolutionary? Is it successful? Is it not successful? Um, and I, in some ways, I feel like if I look at this company, it lets me kind of look at some of those questions and ask them with, without, the problem there is then like without directly engaging all of that literature, it doesn't always, um, it doesn't always work because each one of these chapters is engaging a very, I think, different literature on some level. So the first one is looking at the reconstruction of the oil industry, but also what's the impetus for the invasion of Azerbaijan? Why are they even going there in the first place? What, how are they conceiving of the region? Are they really conceiving of the region as we have seen in these debates between economics and nationalities? You know, everything I kept saying was this, that the, it's one economic unit, it's one economic unit. It was one economic unit, Transcaucasia in the imperial period. And it's set up that way in the Transcaucasian Federation so I'm thinking, okay, well, what does that mean? And oil is a way to ask the question, what, what does that mean if we look at it from this resource? And when we look at it from sort of the imperatives of the industry, um, it does look like that. It looks like very clearly, you, you can't have Georgia and Azerbaijan be separate when all of the railway station repair cars for the trains in Azerbaijan are in Tiflis. Right? Like There are some very real tangible infrastructural reasons that they are doing this. And I think that the, I think there's also, anyway, so that's a whole other chapter, but that's kind of, so that's the, the, the like the methodology that I'm trying to do that ties the different chapters together. And then it goes on to sort of the international stage. Um, and the second chapter, and the second chapter is much more about the idea of revolution and what does it, what does revolution mean if you're looking from Baku? And it means something very different. Um, and they co-opt all of these people into the party um, so that they can have legitimacy locally. But what that does is create two completely conflicting ideas of what they want the revolution to look like and what they expect it to look like as they move forward. Um, so that is, and you see that in oil because they are very much making a deal for, they, they literally like make a deal that 
as long as the um, they let oil flow north to Moscow and up the up the Volga, that they're going to put these national communists in power, and they do. Um, and that's something that I would not have found if I wasn't looking at oil. And then the the other chapter is the same. I found all of these these fights with the the geologists um, that I would not have found just looking at oil, I don't think, um, but also how that interacted with the Azerbaijan Communist Party and how that looked on the ground and how that was affecting those fights. So I'm, I guess I'm having, I'm having a little bit of, of a struggle pulling, um, so those are the, the overarching like narrative themes. Um, how it fits in this chapter, I think is, um, more complicated, I guess I'm not as clear in this chapter. Um, I think that it's still this, that it shows you kind of the inner workings of what's actually going on. So it is this very chaotic story about oil and, but it's also in, and a chaotic story about how is Soviet power functioning this far away from Moscow. Um, but it also is a whole bunch of people who are really committed to this idea of making sure that Soviet power stays intact and doing some pretty crazy things to make sure that they are doing it. Um, and I think that like all of these, the, the coordination and the, the missteps and the involvement with Hoshtaria, like I actually think that it's it's a testament to the fact that they're, you know, they, they could kind of abandon this project at any time and they don't. And I think that there's, um, and maybe that goes to Michael's point at the beginning that, that there, this is still a revolutionary project, um, perhaps in a, in a very different format. Um, I don't know if that clarified anything. <laughs> it clarified a lot actually. And uh, I think that could, you know, really help if you put things more injected some of that, you know, bigger picture stuff in the, in the course of the chapter. Craig, you want to speak again? Sorry. I just wanted to ask, um, as you were looking at Iran, certainly after the war and even before the revolution, I mean, you mentioned Golubyatnikov, the one of the geologists, and I think he actually cut his teeth early on doing prospecting uh, in Iran. So I, I think that was part of his area of expertise. So I imagine he was probably presenting it. But after the, the, the Second World War, uh, as they return to Iran, there's this sense that Baku, again, is it, it had been deemed vulnerable, um, as we all saw during the war. Uh, and uh, there was this sense that if the Americans and the British were getting a cut of Iranian oil, we as the Soviets should as well. And by the way, with Baku perhaps in terminal decline, we need fresh reserves. W were they using a similar argument to during the 1920s as they were looking at Iran that we're not certain if we'll be able to get Baku back up to where it was. And so we need to find new reserves. Um, but just back to this question about um, the unitary nature of the Cauc Caucasian industrial infrastructure around the oil industry. Uh, are you carrying that argument all the way up into um, Soviet Russia as well? Since without Baku oil, you have no Soviet industry uh, or no prospects for Soviet industry, because uh, the, uh, at least in, in the early 20s, uh, although there were plenty of opportunities, or there was there was a sense that there were major reserves up in the north uh, and in the Volga Basin nothing had really been properly prospected. So without Baku, um, the Soviets stood no chance of being able to, uh, to develop and um, the, the, or continue developing the industrial infrastructure of Russia. Uh, so two, two related questions about um, the uh, Iran on the one hand um, uh, as a replacement for declining Baku, but also uh, Baku being essential for the Soviet industrial, uh, uh, the so Soviet Russian industrial um, outlook. I love this question. Um, they don't agree. <laughs> so basically the, um, there's a strong contingent that says we can absolutely rebuild these fields. Um, and the reason that the fields are in such 
decline is because they weren't taken care of under the capitalists and they let them get flooded and they, you know, let, you know, and there's actually, there's a really wonderful dissertation chapter on this by Nicholas Lund, who has, I think the, the, for me, the best dissertation that I have read that specifically focuses on sort of 19, oh, 1900 to uh, 1914. And he has a really, really wonderful um, chapter that looks at the relationship between um, St. Petersburg and the um, like land leases and land policy and how that affects the decline in the industry. Um, so that the, the decline issue is an interesting one. And I think the way that they get around this is that they, so by 1926, they've gotten back up to the production levels that they had before the war. Um, but they're slating it like, after they meet the very basic needs of the, the Russian economy, it's for export. Um, and they are very specifically trying to subsidize the coal industry. So they actually make a decision that looks kind of bonkers where they reconvert a bunch of like railroads, steamships, all kinds of stuff. They reconvert it back to coal, even though they had the Russian empire had been the first to use them um, as, as um, oil powered, yes. And they do this because they decide it's partly a political decision. It's partly kind of in the, the moment of reconstruction. They decide that the Soviet economy will be a coal economy and it will not be an oil economy. Um, and the oil economy will basically rebuild Ukraine um, and re by getting the, the, you know, the hard currency and, and getting the money. And it will also help rebuild the railroads. And it's, so it's about reconstruction more than it is about um, the oil industry itself. And then there's a, they know there's other oil. They, they don't actually invest in, um, they don't invest in prospecting and they're, they're not doing exploration. Uh, they, and I think there's a huge criticism for this and all over the literature, they do a little bit, um, but the, especially when you get to the five-year plans, what they're measured on is like the depth of drilling. Like they're not, measured on are they finding new fields so it's it's incredibly destructive and they they over drill and they cause more problems than they they had at the beginning of the five-year plan um and it really isn't until later that they they sort of play around a little bit with exploration but it's really after the war um, that they do anything serious in terms of looking for other reserves they're really just trying to uh, rebuild what they have um which they do ultimately do. I think there was a second part of that question. And I have about Iran in the twenties when they're looking at Iran, are they mm. saying um, that this actually might have the potential to be uh, a second Baku, as it were? Uh, they don't think it's a second Baku. They do think they do consider themselves very much part of this post-war um, attempt to get their hands on oil reserves. Like they understand that oil reserves are. Um, even if they're using Baku for, um, for export, they feel like they, they have a lot of discussions about the fact that all Americans are gonna be driving cars and the Americans are gonna be holding all of these oil deposits all over the world and the British are holding oil deposits all over the world and we need to hold oil deposits. And they, when they form Kevir Koran, I know you didn't get a chance to read the chapter, but they declare themselves a Sinclair. We, are, we now have our own Sinclair. So they do think that there's oil there. Um, it's unclear how, like, so they, they, the initial reports are when they're fighting for this concession, they're under the impression that the geology is very similar to the geology in the South. And then they go there and they do their first surveys and it comes back disappointing. You know, it's much heavier, it's much dirtier, it's not the same. Um, but they're not convinced that that's true everywhere. So Golub Yakinkov writes this report at his initial report is, we need to do deep drilling before we can find out. And then he comes back again, I think in 29. And at that point, his, he says, I think that there's something here and that this can be an economic enterprise. And at that point, um, the tide has turned and rapid industrialization, all focused north. They're not as interested, they still wanna hold it because they don't want any of us to have it. But at that point, they're less interested in actually trying to exploit it. But up until then, 
they are taking seriously the idea that, well, they go back and forth. They st it starts that way, and then it becomes a political project, and then they decide, no, there probably is oil here, and we have to do something about it. So that's kind of, it's kind of all over the place. Thank you, Sarah. Thank um, you. We're approaching the end of our time, but we probably could squeeze in one more comment is any, if anyone wants to speak. Raise your hand or forever hold your peace. Krista, hi, I see you've just joined us. Um, you know, I was also gonna comment on the coal versus oil and the fact that you're doing a study on both sides of 1917, as opposed to that Stanford dissertation. That was the one, right, that you referred to, um, you know, and among all the balls that you're juggling in the air, you know, the history of petroleum per se in this chapter is not as pronounced as probably it is in the other chapter. So you have this pr problem of the case study sort of being the last long chapter, but the case study doesn't speak to everything most likely. So at some point, how are you going to deal with this sort of macro history of petroleum as it goes? Because it seems like everything is on the table in the 20s and 30s, coal versus oil, are you going to use oil just for hard currency or, you know, and, you know, it's almost like that's another reason it's revolutionary, right, is because everything is on the table. They can conceive of so many different directions to go. So it seems to me somehow that has to come in, in towards the end of your book. And I'm, how are you going to deal with that? The big, the big history of oil um, piece. I was actually hoping to do it in the introduction. <laughs> um, so I think that having the context ahead of time will actually be really helpful um, in that this is an area when it, it has exploded after World War I. Right? There's all sorts of oil deposits being found everywhere. It's super important for the war. It's also a huge question mark about what's going to happen. There's a panic in 24. Everybody is convinced that all oil reserves are going to disappear forever. And the Soviets actually think that the reason they need to get their hands, and this is to Craig's other question, on these oil deposits is because you got to get them while they're there because they're all going to disappear. So take as much advantage of them and kind of milk the Americans if you can um, to get some money. And then they realize they start finding all these other fields. Um, Texas is a huge one. And that you, then they realize that oil is here to stay. Um, but the, the sort of the, the big, what does the oil industry look like? And I, I'm going to try to actually be kind of brief and say, like, this is how oil was used in the pre revolutionary period. It's declining. Um, for all these technological reasons, but also for many political reasons. Um, and to say that nonetheless, there's all of these questions that we can ask about oil and talk a little bit about where it goes. So just like an overview of the 20s and the 30s and up to the war of what the international oil um, field looks like, what's happening, where are people at? Um, there's all sorts of economic crises Things are crashing, they're up, they're down. Oil is really important. The Soviets get caught dumping. They're acting like a spoiler. They're super involved in the international oil trade, um, which I think is completely counter to any kind of narrative we have. The Soviets kind of disappear. Um, and they're not gone at all. They're also making all kinds of marketing agreements. Um, Standard built a refinery in Batumi, um, which I can only, I found in official history of standard. And then they, I went to the archives to try to find all the material and they destroyed everything except for the note cards. <laughs> so all that material is gone, unfortunately. But um, that is to say those kinds of, I'm gonna, I wanna frame the beginning by saying, and this is a huge part of it is that they really don't know what they're doing. They are making this up as they go along, not just with oil, but with the revolution, with building the state that a lot of this is ad hoc. A lot of it is a result of trying things, those things not working and then trying something else. There are especially, and I'm looking at a very short period, right? This is kind of like a micro study. Um, and I'm, I'm stopping more or less in Azerbaijan once they've completely, like they purged these people who helped set everything up already by 24. Um, and that's a kind of a different timeline, but it also, it coincides with Lenin leaving, but also with 
the recovery of the industry. And then the recovery of the industry means all these people who helped the industry recover are transferred to Moscow. Um, so I, I wanna tie that stuff to the international picture so that when people are starting, they kind of understand where it's going. And then after the, the, the conclusion, I think more of like tying up the loose ends from the chapters um, and showing what happens to a lot of these characters um, pretty much across the board if they didn't die first they're killed in the purges um, most of them for being spies for Anglo-Persian <laughs> um, or other international oil companies which I think is um, interesting uh, but also the the um, obviously it's still Baku is still important I mean they provide like two thirds of the oil for in World War II for the Soviet army. I mean, it's incredible. And that they could do that um, after all these years of decline and some very bad practices, right? Is, is a, I think something that we don't have a good answer for and someone else should go write a book on. Um, so that is what I'm thinking about in terms of the, the conclusion. So kind of flipping that. Yeah, the whole German drive to Baku. So, um, you know, uh, we are at the end of our time and I just thought it was a, a really interesting conversation. And the theme of improvisation, you know, nachadu is the phrase in Russian, right? That could really um, tie a lot of things together uh, in your narrative. And I, I think that it's, uh, let's have a round of applause for Sarah.